the most famous human being in all of history, was a first century Jewish revolutionary. His name was Jesus. Christians believe Jesus was crucified, died, and on the third day rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. But for 2,000 years, there have been those who've challenged the truth of this biblical story. And some have died for expressing those doubts. From Jerusalem to the villages of southern France, from the wildness of distant Kashmir to the exotic Philippines, we shall try to solve this 2,000-year-old mystery. We'll take a journey that asks, did Jesus really die on the cross? The story of Christianity features not only the most famous name in history, but also the most famous event in history, the crucifixion. For some, or even many true believers, the fact that Jesus was crucified, died, rose again and ascended into heaven can be literal truth. But throughout history, there have always been those, sometimes Christians, who've asked awkward questions. Would a man die? after only six hours on the cross. Was he drugged? What really happened in the sepulchre? And if Jesus didn't ascend into heaven, then where did he go? For many Christians, these questions risk undermining the whole basis of Christianity and are extremely controversial. The most crucial part of the story, which all Christians are expected to believe, is the idea that Jesus rose from the dead the resurrection. The resurrection is actually the primary story at the heart of Christianity, without which you wouldn't have a movement. You could have Christianity without the virgin birth. However, none of them tells it without a resurrection story. Despite the best efforts of the church, the resurrection of Jesus and his later ascension into heaven have, for 2,000 years, been fertile ground for heresy. Some people suggest that Jesus was rescued from the crucifixion and escaped to live a secret life in southern France. Some have been convinced that Jesus survived and traveled to the mountain kingdoms of Kashmir, where he lived to the age of 80. With the help of leading historians and theologians, we will examine these most controversial theories. To understand what happened to Jesus after the crucifixion, we need first to look at the facts of his life. But what is historical fact? What is the evidence? Almost all we currently think we know about Jesus comes from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But Matthew and John are the only Gospel writers who were members of the Twelve Disciples, the only ones who could have been present at the events they describe. The four Gospels were all apparently written between 40 and 100 years after the crucifixion, which Roman history tells us happened around 30 AD. But despite the fact that we know them by those four names, modern biblical scholars cannot be absolutely sure who really wrote them. Originally, all these Gospels circulated anonymously. There were no names attached to them until almost 200. And the Christian theologian who came up with the idea of having a New Testament was roundly condemned as a heretic. Whoever did really write the four Gospels, the description of Jesus' death in all of them is brutal. Every year at Easter, Christians in the Philippines reenact the crucifixion of Jesus. They actually volunteer to be crucified. They do it because they believe it will help them to purge their sins. For the onlookers, it's a bloody reminder of what happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago. 
Crucifixion was the most cruel and atrocious punishment that the Romans could inflict. And it was inflicted only for treason and only on slaves. If you were a, a nobleman and you were a traitor, then normally you were strangled, something much simpler and much easier and much less painful. <laughs> After condemnation, the uh, beam, the cross beam, was strapped to the shoulders of the criminal, and he paraded through the streets with his arms stretched out. <laughs> At the place of execution, then, nails were hammered into the hands and the feet. In the Philippines, they do use real nails. They do experience the real pain that Jesus felt. But a man nailed to a cross does not die from his wounds. He dies, surprisingly, from suffocation. Hanging by your arms, the chest is compressed. It's hard to breathe without supporting your weight with your legs. Over time, the strain and the pain make that impossible, and you're unable to breathe. In the Philippines, the volunteers are brought down from their crosses within an hour. Death from crucifixion takes much longer, often several days. The only way to hasten death on the cross was to break the legs, making it immediately impossible to support your weight, and therefore to breathe. But the Gospels are all agreed that Jesus died after only three to six hours. The crucifixion began at the third hour. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Some claim that the Gospel according to Luke has the shortest crucifixion. It was about the sixth hour, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he gave up the ghost. Matthew and Mark have Jesus surviving a little longer. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out. The disciples wanted to take Jesus' body down from the cross immediately. But the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, wasn't convinced that he was dead. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. Pilate was reassured by the centurion. But this was the same centurion who had earlier said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Jesus' body was then laid in a tomb, donated by a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. This Joseph and a man called Nicodemus came to minister to the body. They came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pounds weight. These accounts, when viewed as an historical rather than a sacred record, may raise questions. Why did Jesus die so quickly? Why did Joseph and Nicodemus take so many herbs into the tomb? So it's perhaps not surprising that some people have even dared to ask whether Pilate was right to have his doubts, whether Jesus really did die on the cross. That Jesus might not have died on the cross is an explosive idea, particularly for Christians. In our journey to understand the truth about Jesus' life and death, we need to look further at the biblical accounts of the resurrection. It was here in Jerusalem that Jesus was crucified, and according to the scriptures, rose again from the dead. But in Jerusalem, one is forced to remember that we do not live on a Christian planet. Hundreds of millions of Jews and Muslims may accept that Jesus lived and died in first century Palestine, but only Christians believe he rose from the dead. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, built upon what was supposed to be the tomb in which Jesus was laid after the crucifixion. This, according to devout Christians, is the exact site of the resurrection. And if anything can be described as the cornerstone of the Christian faith, it is the resurrection.
The resurrection of Jesus, as far as all the Christian churches are concerned, is absolutely fundamental to the faith. Um, there's no question, in my mind, that it's ever going to be changed. The resurrection may be fundamental to the faith, but in our examination of what really happened, it's hard to find solid historical evidence. The four Gospels all tell different stories. When we read the resurrection narratives, uh, it's like reading four different reports of the same football game in four rather different newspapers. And uh, the fact that actually there may be some disagreement about whether it was a foul or not doesn't mean that there wasn't a game and that somebody didn't win it and so on. If one of them says there were two angels and another one says there was one angel, if one of them says Mary Magdalene was there all by herself and somebody else says Mary Magdalene was there with one or two other women, um, then these are the sorts of variations that you expect to get, like the different newspaper reports of the football match. Um, and they're not something that should worry you to the point of saying, therefore nothing happened. That would be quite a false conclusion. But in the earliest versions of the earliest gospel, Mark, there are no resurrection appearances at all. The gospel simply ends with the discovery of an empty tomb. The last verses of Mark, which do contain resurrection stories, were added 200 years later. None of the gospel stories is CNN in Jerusalem in the year 30. The Gospels are written in the form of historical biography, so many people have assumed that they are exactly that. But they're, that's not actually what they are. They're written to demonstrate to people the importance and the meaning of Jesus and his teaching. That was what they're for, and they do that very well. But they're not primarily interested in what actually happened back there. Matthew and Luke do have resurrection appearances, but they don't agree about the details. In Matthew, Jesus meets the women near the tomb and then meets his disciples just one time, and that is on a mountain in Galilee. In Luke, Jesus meets two unnamed disciples who do not recognize him, and then with the 11 remaining disciples before leaving them in a village outside Jerusalem. The last gospel, John, has many different resurrection stories. For many modern scholars, these variations suggest that the stories were not written to tell of a miraculous event, but with an entirely different and political motive. For it was the supposed witnesses of the resurrection who became the leaders of the early church. Even to this day, the Pope claims his authority in a direct, unbroken line of ordination from Peter, the first disciple said to have seen the risen Christ. Some scholars go so far as to suggest that the story of the resurrection was also created as an extraordinary psychological tool to bring in new converts. If it hadn't been for the resurrection of Jesus and his rising from the dead, victorious from the dead, we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas. It's a bit like when you go into the army, the first thing we want is to take over your body. So symbolically, let's say we're going to shave all your hair. As long as you give in on this, we got you. We got your body, which is what we want. In one sense, sometimes the churches, some churches at least, do the same. We're going to tell you something unbelievable that you've got to believe. When they could just relax. If you believe it, then you will believe that they alone control heaven, that without them you cannot get into heaven, and then they've got you. You've left your brains in the parking lot. That's a statement that may be offensive to many Christians. It would certainly be offensive to the worshippers at the Toronto Airport Church, who take their belief in the literal truth of the resurrection of Jesus very seriously indeed. For these Christians, the risen Christ is an active part of the church. And they believe that in 1994, Jesus blessed their church with a miraculous healing mission. For one minute, bodos in the spirit for one minute. Since then, thousands of churches around the world have claimed to be touched by what became known as the Toronto Blessing. Glorious coming into the room. 
and in Toronto, in a splendid new church built by contributions from the faithful, the congregation continue to celebrate their belief in the resurrected Christ. Well, be blessed. Here, on an almost weekly basis, they claim that their faith has the power to miraculously heal. So God's going to heal you right now? There it goes, and the neck is healed in Jesus' name. Don't you like it? I like it! Bless you, brother. Today, it seems to me that there are many people who will strongly defend the literal truth of the resurrection. Many others who are Christians or not Christians believe that perhaps, you know, those who die may be alive in some way, that Jesus who died might be in some sense alive, whatever one means by that. And there are many others who take it as a as an image of hope, because after all, we, talking about the resurrection of Jesus has a great deal to do with what we think about life after death, or for that matter, our own prospects. The problem for the church in the 21st century, in a technological and secular age, is that some people find it hard to believe in the literal truth of the miracles, let alone the miracle of the resurrection. Since the 18th century, we, we, we've lived in a climate where people have distinguished between faith and belief. So the, the whole effect of science on religion, really, has been to throw religion back to prove what we can believe in. But week in and week out, congregations gather in Christian churches and recite together an ancient creed, from the Latin word credo, meaning I believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. At the climax of the creed, all Christians affirm their belief in the resurrection. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his but whatever is said in church, Many Christian theologians no longer consider the resurrection to be an historical fact. And this has not just been a problem of the 21st century. A thousand years ago, a group of devout Christians in southern France also held unorthodox, heretical views. In the 11th and 12th centuries, the Cathars, a deeply religious group, believed that all material things were the work of the devil. They saw Jesus as an angel, who certainly could not have been physically crucified and certainly would not have been resurrected as a physical body. It was actually in response to the Cathar heresy that the church created the Inquisition. In 1244, the last 200 of the Cathars were rounded up and burned at the stake as heretics. The church has always reacted strongly against anyone who doubted the truth of the resurrection because that doubt insinuates that the very literal and physical gospel descriptions of the death and resurrection of Jesus are fabrications. But there is one story, also set in France, at about the same time as the Cathars, which suggests that another Christian group made a discovery which really might reveal that the resurrection story was not true. In the 13th century, this whole area was a stronghold of the Knights Templar, a strict religious and military order of warrior monks. Local historian Thierry Lecon has spent the last 12 years uncovering the history of the Knights Templar in this region. The Templars came to this region. There are traces of them all over the countryside. Down there at the bottom, near Chateau de Blanchefond, there are ruins of an old Templar command post. The Knights Templar were committed to poverty, chastity, and the protection of pilgrims en route to the Holy Land. But their main purpose was to keep Jerusalem and the holy sites of Christianity free from the forces of Islam. During the years they were in the Holy Land, the Templars built their own castles. But they buried their dead in graveyards they excavated near to the original Temple of Solomon. And certainly, during this time, they were thought to have discovered great treasures.
Eventually, the Templars were forced to leave the Holy Land in 1186. They returned to France. Certainly, the Templars remained powerful, rich, and incredibly secretive, so it's not surprising that people speculated about them. And there grew a legend that the Knights Templar had discovered Jesus' bones in Jerusalem, that they had brought them back to France, and they had buried them somewhere near here. The legend that a thousand years ago, the Templars might have found an ossuary box containing Jesus' bones has led modern scholars to a small church in the village of Rennes-le-Chateau. Writer Richard Andrews is convinced that there are clues here that might reveal what exactly the Templars did find during their excavations in Jerusalem. One can ask the question, did the Templars find relics, an ossuary full of bones that they thought were possibly the bones of Jesus? Now, if they had found these, it would have been a shock to the system because the Templars were good Christians. This would challenge the whole doctrine of resurrection because here are mortal remains. So we ask a second question, why should the Templars risk being accused of heresy and bringing the bones that they thought were Jesus's back to this area. The answer is simple. If they had found something which they believed were the bones of Christ, they needed a safe location. You could hide a church in these mountains, let alone a small ossuary. You can get lost in these mountains today. Imagine what it was like a thousand years ago. In the late 19th century, the local priest here, called Berenger Saunier, claimed to have found ancient documents. And whatever they were, he certainly became very rich afterwards. Richard Andrews has found clues among these parchments, using elaborate geometry and transferring symbols from ancient paintings onto equally ancient maps, all in the hope of finding a Templar treasure trove. The clues that we found point to um, a map in the form of a hexagram, which is also known as the Seal of Solomon, but it is the Star of David. This map points to a specific site. Now we know that the priest, Berenger Sonnier, became fabulously wealthy, but we are sure that he didn't actually find what he was looking for. We can deduce, perhaps, that Sonnier received money from patrons to look for a location in the area that might reveal perhaps the bones of Christ. Whatever it is, we do know one thing for sure. The secret that Saunier was giving clues to was heretical. Saunier died in 1917 and took his secret with him to the grave. That hasn't stopped enthusiasts like Thierry Lecon from continuing to search on the basis of Richard's work and trying to solve the mystery. Using local maps on which the geometric lines from Saunier's original parchments have been transposed, Thierry has found further evidence of the Templars' presence here, and he believes he's closing in on the location where the Templars could have buried the bones of Jesus. There you have the summit of Mount Cardu, and there are two cedars there, about 10 meters distance between them. They form an alignment, traversing the valley of Rennes-les-Rains, arriving at the Plateau des Bruyères, where there's a rock with a cross. I lined up the compass. I took a long time and I made a lot of mistakes. But I was convinced I'd find something, a cedar or another cross. And then I found a cross. There's the famous cross. I spent a long time very near it, but without finding the place. It was a little set back from the plateau. It took me 12 years to find this cross. 
Even if the Knights Templar did bring Jesus' bones in an ossuary box back here from the Holy Land, it seems unlikely that Thierry Lecon or Richard Andrews would ever find them in these mountains. However, there have been those who've gone back to the original gospel stories of Jesus' death and resurrection and come up with more credible but no less startling conclusions about what exactly happened 2,000 years ago. You read the story of the empty tomb, and on Friday someone is killed, and on Sunday they're gone from the tomb, and you ask the question, what might have happened? Either God raised him from the dead, which is the traditional Christian affirmation, or the body was carried away by someone, body stolen. But there is another possibility. The Gospels describe how, after his resurrection, Jesus ate, drank, and Thomas could touch his wounds. It's therefore perhaps not surprising that some people who've looked for natural explanations of miracles have suggested that Jesus was alive because he didn't die on the cross. There are many versions of that story. One came up in a book years ago called The Passover Plot, which suggested that he had been sedated on the cross, that he was removed quite early, and therefore could well have survived. That's certainly a possibility. The disciples did manage to give Jesus some kind of substance on a sponge. They filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. And Jesus immediately died after taking this substance. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. But oddly enough, it isn't necessary to suggest that Jesus was sedated or drugged by whatever was on the sponge in order to believe that he could have survived. There are stories of people who did survive crucifixion. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote of one of his own friends surviving crucifixion in Palestine in the first century. He's traveling out to a village named Tekoa to scout land for a Roman camp. And he notices that three of his friends are hanging on crosses. So he requests that uh, they be allowed to, uh, that they be brought down. And Titus, the Roman general, gives him permission. The three are brought down immediately and given medical care. And two of them died, but the, the third survived. So is it possible that Jesus survived? Certainly his crucifixion was speedily executed, perhaps too speedily. When you look at the story of Jesus and how he was executed by the Romans, he's on the cross for six hours. The assumption is that he's dead. The Roman soldiers checked the body. Uh, there were two others crucified, according to the gospel accounts. And they broke the legs of those to hasten their death because the Sabbath day was coming. When they came to Jesus, they said he, he's already dead. Presumably, uh, his body's motionless. He's quit breathing. They then uh, prepare the body and put him in a tomb. And presumably, it's sealed up. and. Uh, He's dead for all practical purposes. Uh, the question, though, is, is he clinically dead? The question of clinical death is certainly raised by the fact that the herbs which Joseph of Arimathea took into the tomb with the body of Jesus were aloes. These are healing, not embalming herbs. We do have stories, both from the modern world and from the ancient world, where people appear to be dead and for all practical purposes they are dead that is they're not responding to the outside world but then they do in fact revive or come back we call it resuscitation but if you want to press the language that would be resurrection the idea that Jesus might have survived the crucifixion rather than risen from the dead seems provocative. But all the Gospels are quite clear that the disciples saw Jesus as if he were alive. If Jesus did survive, it does not necessarily mean that the resurrection story was a hoax or a deliberate falsehood. At the end of the 19th century, the English writer Samuel Butler, in his book on the resurrection, came up with the theory that if Jesus had collapsed into a shock-induced coma on the cross, and then recovered in the tomb, he and his disciples would actually have thought his recovery was a miraculous resurrection.
that still has great credibility if you see it in the light, for instance, of more contemporary development. Look at the near-death experience in the United States. Something like 13 million people in the United States say they've had near-death experiences. They've seen this white light. They believe it to be some form of miracle. So the idea that in the first century when they had none of this scientific insight and they had none of these hospitals or whatever to save them, that people thought it actually makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make them fraudsters or shysters. It actually makes them genuine people who thought they'd witnessed a miracle. Whatever the circumstances, if Jesus was alive, then he and his disciples face a serious problem. If Jesus was placed in the tomb and somehow was revived, he himself would certainly think that was an act of the grace of God. I came right to the bars of death and was brought back. But now there's a practical problem. It's a political problem, actually. Romans basically do one thing to messiahs, they crucify them. If Jesus did indeed survive crucifixion, either through resurrection as the Bible tells us, or more controversially, through resuscitation, then he is once more a condemned man. The Bible is said to solve this problem with a miracle called the Ascension. Jesus is taken bodily into heaven. But the interesting fact is that the Ascension does not actually appear in the original form of the Gospels. The Ascension references in Mark are among the verses which, as we've seen, were added 200 years later. There is one line in Luke which reads, and was carried up into heaven. But again, this does not appear in all Bibles. It was, in fact, inserted simply because the Ascension is referred to in a later book of the Bible, the Acts of the Apostles, and it's always been assumed that Luke was the author of the Acts. There's no ascension in Matthew, and John's Gospel ends with the enigmatic words, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So what was it that Jesus did? One of the stories that emerges from this question depends upon the idea that Jesus' relationship with Mary Magdalene was a very special one. If you read John's Gospel, the first person who saw the risen Christ, i.e. the first Christian, was Mary Magdalene. So I think when the church tries to sideline the idea that Jesus had relationships with women, that he had close relationships with women, it's laughable, really. I mean, it's part of this problem that they always say that, um, that the thing that non-believers find hardest about Jesus was his divinity, and the thing that Christians always find hardest about Jesus was his humanity. I mean, he was a, he was a man. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with the concept that, that, that Jesus had a relationship with Mary Magdalene, that, that it was long and important and, you know, was one of the dominant things in his life. He was human. The idea, of course, that Jesus may have had a very special relationship with Mary may be offensive to many Christians, but some historians have gone even further. They've suggested that Jesus and Mary might have married, that they might even have had children. So if we're trying to find out where, in his flight from the Romans, Jesus could have gone, perhaps we should start by finding out where Mary went. There is a tradition that some years after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene came to the Carmarg region of the south of France. Here she lived and died, and the Basilica Sainte Marie Madeleine is a shrine to her memory. This was the center of what became known as the Cult of the Magdalene. The Cult of the Magdalene was very powerful in France up until the Middle Ages. The faithful wanted to believe in a mother figure and the church were very anxious that they should not believe in Mary Magdalene as having been a mother figure for obvious reasons which were that she might have been the spouse of Christ that she might have had his child that she might have produced a bloodline the local legend describes how Mary Magdalene came here with her brother Lazarus and her sister Martha and a few companions If the relationship between Jesus and Mary was as close as some sources suggest, perhaps one of those companions, traveling incognito for fear of arrest by the Romans, was Jesus himself. Jesus could have taken ship 
at Caesarea, or one of the smaller ports up the Syrian coast, and he could have left for another life. And he could well have arrived, as a lot of people believe, in this part of France and begun a new life. He could even have brought his family with him. So these stories could have a historical foundation. After her death, Mary Magdalene's relics were placed in a sarcophagus and then hidden. It was not until 1279 that they were rediscovered, and this basilica was built for their safekeeping. Sealed within the crypt, in the center of the church, is what is claimed to be the skull of Mary Magdalene. The idea that Jesus went to the south of France may seem far-fetched. After all, if any of the stories were true, it's hard to believe that the original writers of the Gospels could have completely eradicated all of the evidence. If the faithful knew that Jesus was in fact still alive, surely they would have shared that knowledge. And surely they must have hoped that at some time in the future it would have been safe for Jesus to return. And evidence for that hope should be somewhere in the original text. The disciples were expecting Jesus to return. They were expecting what has become known as the second coming. And this was not necessarily going to be a miraculous return. Jesus definitely went away. Whatever view of resurrection you take, resuscitation or divine miracle, in the traditional sense of belief in resurrection, he goes away. He says, I'm going away. The disciples say, can we come? He says, no. And he says, I'm going to come again. Now, what's interesting about that is normally, if someone says they're going away, and they're gonna come back, and you're sort of looking at your watch or your calendar, wondering, okay, he said he went away, he's gonna come back. You would take it in that uh, everyday sense. The concept of the heavenly second coming of Jesus returning on the day of judgment was only created after it was clear that Jesus had not returned in that everyday sense. But if Jesus did decide to leave Palestine, France still doesn't seem like a likely destination. It was, after all, a Roman colony. Some claim that if Jesus did survive the crucifixion, his first priority would be to escape from the clutches of the Romans. Jesus, I think, would have to leave the territory. And we have to ask the question, where would he go? And it, it, you just look at a map. Palestine is on the uh, far eastern border of the Roman Empire. If you go west, you're going right into the heart of Roman territory, where we have our 15 legions stationed around the world. If you go east, you're crossing over into Parthia and you're going towards Persia eventually and India and Afghanistan, that direction. But apart from escaping re-arrest, why would Jesus travel east? And how would he get there? If Jesus did want to travel east, away from the Roman Empire, the journey from Israel was surprisingly easy by land or by sea, on the Silk Route or the Spice Route. It's an accepted fact, for instance, that the disciple Thomas traveled to India and founded a Christian church there. The great tradition of the Indian church is that it was founded by Thomas the Apostle. To travel to India, would be no problem. He just had to go down to Gaza and link up with one of the spice trains returning and then from Yemen get a boat to India. It would have been a very simple, easy procedure that was done regularly. And there's another reason why Jesus might have been tempted to go east. But to understand that, we have to go back to the year of his birth. We all recognize the story in Matthew's Gospel of the three wise men from the east who followed a star and presented themselves and their gifts to the baby Jesus. What we perhaps don't recognize immediately is the similarity between this story and the traditions of a religion that is 500 years older than Christianity, Buddhism. <laughs> 
When a great Buddhist holy man or lama dies, wise men consult the stars and other omens and set off, often on extraordinarily long journeys, to find the infant who is the reincarnation of the lama. When the child is old enough, he's taken away from his parents and educated in the Buddhist faith. Could this be the origin of the story of the three wise men? Could Jesus have been taken to India as a child and taught as a Buddhist? The Russian writer Nikolai Notovich, traveling in India in the 19th century, discovered an ancient manuscript in a Buddhist monastery in Tibet. In his book, The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ, Notovich translated this manuscript and it tells of a divine child called Isa, born in the first century, to a poor family in Israel. Isa came to India at the age of 14, where he learned the laws of Buddhism before returning to Israel at the age of 29. This idea would certainly explain the otherwise odd fact that from the age of 14 to 29, there's absolutely no record of Jesus' existence in Palestine. Certainly Jesus' later teaching and miracles have uncanny parallels with the teaching and miracles of the Buddha. Loving your enemies and the idea that the meek will inherit the earth have absolutely no tradition in the Jewish religion but are entirely consistent with Buddhism. And the Buddha was known to walk on water and miraculously to feed many hundreds of his disciples with only a few scraps of food. But if Jesus traveled or returned to the East, surely there would be legends like those in the south of France to support the idea. And of course there are such traditions. The people here in Kashmir call their tribe ben e israel and claim to be descendants of the lost tribes. And here there are stories that the first century preacher, Isa, known locally as Yusasaf, meaning leader of the healed, returned to Kashmir in his thirties. Yus Asaf's ministry here can easily be seen as a continuation of the Jesus ministry. And in a local temple called the Temple of Solomon, there used to be an inscription which told of Yus Asaf's claim around the year 50 AD to be Jesus, the prophet from Israel. Kashmiri history books tell us that Yusasaf came from abroad. He was a prophet and a messenger. He came from Israel. He came to spread his teachings. He lived and died here. He is Jesus. He is Isa. The meaning of Yusasaf is the healer. Another meaning is the shepherd, one who teaches others. And our history books confirm that Isa was known as Yusasaf here in Kashmir. Yusasaf continued to teach and preach in Kashmir until he died around the year 80 AD. He was buried in Srinagar. And this, they say, is Yusasaf's tomb. The first building erected around this site was built in 112 AD. In fact, it's now a shared gravesite. In the 15th century, the Islamic holy man Siad Nazir ud Din was also buried here. Although both gravestones under the cloth point north-south in the Islamic tradition, the body of Yusasaf is buried beneath in a grave dug east-west in the Jewish tradition. Next to the sarcophagus are two carved footprints. The marks on these 
are said to be the symbolic representations of the scars of crucifixion. The footprints were carved as a sign. The scars are clearly visible, received when he was nailed to the cross. They show that this is the same person who came from Israel and that he lived and died here. You won't find any footprints like these anywhere else in Kashmir. We don't have that tradition. The position of the scars, just behind the toes, do not match each other. But they would align if a single nail was driven through both feet with the left foot placed over the right. There are many who believe this tomb to be the tomb of Jesus. If this is the tomb of Jesus, then he spent most of his life in the mountain kingdom of Kashmir. He did not die on the cross. There was no resurrection. He did not ascend into heaven and he does not sit at the right hand of God. For many Christians, this would be the end of Christianity as we know it. But for some, the original story would still have a poetic power. For me, the resurrection is about death. The two things that will happen to us all in our life is that we'll be born and that we'll die. They're the two things we know nothing about. And we have this great void before and we have this great void afterwards. So any system of belief, any religion, any church that set itself up has always had to have some concept, some way of dealing with death. So in Jesus' resurrection at the end of the, the Easter story is, is the symbolism of our own resurrection, of our own new life. That in many ways is the great strength of, of, of Christianity and I think to kind of get away from it, to get away from that incredibly powerful symbolism of the resurrection that touches each and every one of us because of the reality of what will happen to us and start debating whether, you know, bones in a tomb matter or whether it actually happened completely misses the point of Christianity. And there will always be those for whom none of the inconsistencies and anomalies in the Gospels mean anything. For them, the story still has the hallmarks of truth, of gospel truth. I understand that people find it difficult to believe because we know these things don't happen. If you think that you've just seen somebody who was dead now alive again, you say, well, take two aspirins and lie down and it'll go away. And, and the thing was, it didn't go away. And what we have in the Gospels is not stories of people saying, well, of course, here he is, he's alive again. We have stories of people saying, what do you mean? Don't be silly, that can't happen. They knew as well as we do. And yet, right in the heart of it all, they come back and say, it really has happened, it's completely blown us away, it's changed our worldview, and it's gone on changing people's worldviews ever since.